welcome everybody uh, to the first IIDR ID rounds of uh, 2021. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. I hope you had a very quiet and subdued New Year so that Dominic doesn't have to work even harder than he already is. Um, our speakers today uh, are Dominic Mertz and Gregory Kerfanti. Thank you very much guys for doing this today. So Dominic is the Infectious Divi Diseases Division Director at McMaster and the Medical Director of Infection Control for Hamilton Health Sciences. Dominic's research focuses on identification of risk factors for infection or colonization by organisms that are antimicrobial resistant. Uh, the prevention of transmission and outbreaks uh, by AMR in a hospital setting and antimicrobial stewardship as a preventative measure to slow down the spread of AMR. Uh, today, he'll be talking about the epi and clinical relevance of antifungal resistance. Um, our second speaker today is uh, Greg, who is a PhD student in uh, JP Zoo's lab. And Greg's work focuses on the human fungal pathogen Aspergillus fumigatus, especially on antifungal susceptibility and population genetics of strains obtained from environmental soil samples. And he'll be talking about resistance mechanisms and drug development. So thank you again to both of you. And I will pass the mic over to you. OK, thanks, Laurie. So what we put together for today um, is a talk, obviously, about antifungal resistance. And uh, I, I mean, to be honest, it's nothing that I spent too much time in the past on. and. Um, certainly wouldn't consider myself an expert in any way in this field. However, with the increase in antifungal resistance, I felt, or both of us, Greg and I felt, it's probably important to raise awareness that um, antimicrobial resistance is not, it's not only about bacteria becoming resistance, that it's also important in terms of fungal infections. What I will show today is give you some, um, crude ideas about antifungal use in our hospitals using our Hamilton Health Sciences sites, how I may be able to explain the changes over the last um, years, and then touch on two uh, fungal infections. One, Candida auris, probably the most famous one, I would say, in terms of resistant uh, fungal infections. And then given Craig's research focus, of course, Aspergillus fumigatus, where um, resistance also is becoming more and more of an issue. And uh, outlining the importance of the One Health approach, that's when Greg will take over. He will go into more uh, details in terms of what resistance really means, uh, resistant mechanisms, and then go into development of new antifungals. So you're probably all well aware of that. In the meantime, it's not top three, it's top five. That's the last version I saw, and that was before SARS-CoV-2, so probably currently number six of the greater threats to human health. But nevertheless, antimicrobial resistance is a big issue, as we know, and will stay with us for a very, very long time. And there's unlikely to be vaccines helping us with this one. Uh, I'm showing you some antifungal use data first, and uh, for those not familiar with how we measure that, we measure that in defined daily doses per 1,000 patient days. That's a WHO-defined um, metric uh, for the average dose for the average patient for the typical indication uh, per day, and we normalize that by 1,000 patient days. What you can see in the top graph here, appreciating that it's um, a relatively small graph with a very long timeline, you see a timeline from 2008 to October 2020. The blue line is your overall antimicrobial use over this time period, and we saw a reduction in the range of maybe 10-15% in total antimicrobial use over the years. Uh, while for antifungals, which is the red line, you would see okay, it's a very small proportion of what we throw at patients in terms of antimicrobials in an ICU setting. And there's been not a huge change. There was a small reduction, but you, you see that we already start quite low compared to in particular the uh, antibiotics. At the bottom, I just highlight the two most frequently used antifungals on 
that I see at the general, where the main issue are candida infections, what they are dealing with. And you can see that there's a reduction in fluconazole use, while there's an increase in anidulafungin use since it's widely available. So anidulafungin is the blue line, fluconazole is the green line. Uh, fluconazole currently sitting at roughly one quarter of what we would have used back in 2008. There's certainly all the factors playing into this as well with less what we call preemptive treatment where patients colonize with uh, candida were, st were started on antifungals to prevent fungemia, which was a common approach 10 years back, but has largely been um, left in the meantime. But you see that switch from fluconazole to more anibulafungin, and why is that? So it's mostly the increase in candida non albican species that we have to deal with. And when you're looking at fluconazole resistance in the US, those non albicans are more likely to be resistant. So with candida albicans, it's maybe 2%. That's US data here. Candida tropicalis, 5%. European data suggests more than 10%. Carpsilosis 4%, Clabrada 10%, and then non listed Prusa, which is inherently resistant uh, with 100%. So, what you see happening is with antifungal exposure, this selects for colonization and infection with less susceptible species, and the most common ones we see, I would say, are Prusa and Clabrada, and less albicans, as I mentioned. As I said, I will talk about Candida auris today as well. Um, and that's what I just said about the antifungal exposure certainly is true for Candida auris as well. And I will show you the resistance data later. The main risk factors to get an infection with Candida auris are officially central line and critical illness. But first and foremost, it's environmental contamination and outbreaks that are driving those infections. There's been very large outbreaks globally reported. And this is very unique to, can, to Candida auris. We haven't had outbreaks like that with any of the other Candida, and Candida auris can remain in the environment for, for months and continue to colonize and infect patients. This is the CDC website, Candida auris epidemiology. And what you can basically see is that with maybe a few exceptions like Denmark, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden that you see here, it's been identified in the vast majority of countries where you would expect that they have the lab capacity to identify Candida auris as well. I think in Africa, many countries have other issues to deal with than identifying Candida auris. So it may be there, but we simply don't know. When you're looking at the US, then I think it's important to note that it's not far away from us despite the little to no activity that we continue to see in Canada when you're looking at New York State. Um, however, New York State mostly driven by New York City, which had large outbreaks. So not just Buffalo across the border, but nevertheless, um, again, similar picture to what we see with other resistance. There's more going on in the US than in Canada. Other hotspots, as you can see here, California and Illinois. This is from a systematic review, so only looking at peer-reviewed literature and how many cases reported. I highlighted Canada here with just the one case based on the PHAC data. We are sitting at more than 20 cases uh, nationwide in the meantime, so still rare, not aware of any major outbreaks uh, in contrast to the US. Uh, South Africa, another hotspot, then India, as you probably know, and also Spain. Spain also tends to be a hotspot for everything resistance related, being it CPEs, but also Candida auris. Uh, just some history here. The first case was reported in Japan 2009 in a patient with an ear infection. In the peer-reviewed literature, almost 5,000 cases reported by now in over 33 countries. The only continent not affected is the Antarctica. Um, there's a decrease in annual numbers reported since 2016, but keeping in mind, this is a systematic review. So people probably still simply didn't care anymore about single or small case series of Candida auris and didn't get that published anymore. While in the early days, everything with Candida auris on it got, got published. So that's probably more reporting bias than a, a true decline in, in case numbers. 
we have four clades, South Asia, East Asia, South African, and South American clade um, in what we would refer to as Central Canada. So Quebec, uh, Ontario, we mostly see the South American clade. And um, what we saw is that these clades uh, emerge independently and have different resistance mechanisms. So it's probably not just one spread within a few years across the globe. It's, it's all those four clades that emerged independently over time. As you probably also know, Candida auris uh, has been and probably to some extent continues to be misidentified as other species, in particular uh, Himuloniae. Uh, it's circulating since at least 2009 based on the J Japanese case, but based on biobanks, uh, South Korea identified Candida auris as far back as 1996. So it's probably been with us for a much longer period of time than what we thought back in 2009. I mentioned fluconazole resistance, and again, this is from this um, meta-analysis. Um, on average, roughly 90% of the candida auris are fluconazole resistance. So um, very close to where candida cruse would sit with 100%, much higher resistance than any of the other uh, candida species. There's a few outliers here, though. And for B resistance, um, somewhere around 10% here. Uh, and again, quite some heterogeneity across the, um, the case series or cohorts that have been published. Echinocandines uh, typically reported as less than 10% resistance. Um, but uh, India would be reporting cuspal fungin resistance of 12.1%, which is typical for the clades that they have in India. Um, Anidula fungin uh, consistently reported as very low resistance, so typically 1%. Hence, the empiric choice that is recommended is Anidula fungin plus minus M for B. Um, they are resistant against two or more. Um, classes of antifungals, as you could probably have guessed from the data I've shown you, um, reported in 43%, again, more frequently on the Indian subcontinent. Um, and the same is true for, uh, I would say, a pan-resistant candida auris, which again in India can be as high as 4%. Crude mortality is sitting at roughly 40% across all those uh, studies or reports, keeping in mind this is crude mortality. Um, we, we are unclear about what, what the attributable mortality is, how it really compares to candida albicans, keeping in mind that patients getting those infections typically have a lot of comorbidities. They, have, they are critically ill and as such have a high propensity for a bad outcome, even in the absence of candida auris. So there's still a question mark there, but if you get it, it's a bad sign nevertheless. Switching gears now to, um, to the mold infections. And what I'm showing you here is again, uh, antifungal, uh, first anti-infective use overall, and the antifungal use at the Chorvinsky Hospital, where we take care of our uh, immunocompromised hematologic patients in particular. Um, what you can see here, again, the top graph first, um, the defined daily doses per 1,000 patient days uh, came down significantly since 2008 from about 2,000 to 1,300, 400 uh, in the last quarter. So a, a huge reduction there. We also see a reduction here in red um, in the antifungals, but again, compared to what we see in anti-infectives overall, rel relatively small numbers here. Main driver here, you could see the, um, the, the green lines, that's fluconazole. Again, less prophylaxis in this population, which had been used in the past. Um, less preemptive treatment huge reductions in antifungal use, also a reduction in the red line, which is cusper fungin. Um, but we see an increase instead for posaconazole, which is used for prophylaxis for mold infections, and voriconazole, which is first-line treatment for 
uh, the vast majority of mold infections, certainly for invasive vasculosis, which have been increasing over time. Now, some background about Aspergillus fumigatus. Here, the primary host, as I already alluded to, is the transplant population, so heavily immunocompromised individuals. I picked here the uh, solid organ transplant population. A similar point can be made, obviously, about the hematologic population. Depending on the type of, um, um, of transplant, somewhere between 1 and 15 percent will develop a at least probable um, invasive aspergillosis. Mortality, even with treatment, is 20 percent for lung transplant patients, very high with 65 percent here. I don't go into too much detail, but I mentioned the term probable. Um, the vast majority of cases, we don't have a proven infection which would uh, require a tissue that shows invasive aspergillosis. Typically, it's a probable um, infection. That means you have the appropriate host, you have some clinical features and mycological evidence of aspergillus. Uh, either directly or indirectly through galactaman and antigene. And then there's the uh, option of a possible invasive hospitalosis, which is only your host factor and clinical features in the absence of a mycological evidence. Um, but, and that's my only detour here today into the realm of SARS-CoV-2. There's also post-influenza and case series now with SARS-CoV-2 infections um, that result or are associated at least with invasive aspergillosis. And I will quickly take that detour, nevertheless appreciated that I'm only sort of scratching uh, on the surface here. So the, um, the influenza um, narrative here, um, I, I picked this study here. There's multiple cohort studies or case series out there. So this is a cohort of ICU admitted patients with lab confirmed influenza infections that required mechanical ventilation. So you severe cases of flu. 19% uh, of those in a relatively large cohort here, multicenter, um, had a diagnosis of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, keeping in mind that the diagnosis isn't as clear cut as it may be uh, proposed here, because we don't have well, ac well accepted criteria, I would say, to, to diagnose it in the non-immunocompromised population. Um, what they found also is that it's higher in the immunocompromised hosts with 32% versus 14% in the non-immunocompromised hosts. Mortality, a difference here, 51% in those who were identified as having potential pulmonary aspergillosis, while it was only 28% in absence of that with an odds ratio of 5.2. Then Elon Schwartz and Stephanie Smith from Edmonton published this study um, earlier this year. Again, a cohort of ICU admitted patients, very similar lab confirmed flu infections with severe courses since 2014. 7.2% here met their definition of a potential invasive aspergillosis diagnosis, ranging from 0% to 23%, uh, depending on which season they looked at. Um, they had deaths in patients who were treated. They had survivors among non-treated individuals. So very hard to tell whether treatment makes a difference here. And I will come back to that again. Now, there's no presentation these days without COVID-19. Uh, I show you a couple here. So this is a cohort study, early study in 27 mechanically ventilated COVID-19 patients. So similar population uh, as in the studies I showed you prior, but instead of flu infections, they have COVID-19. They use the um, criteria I showed you previously for the immunocompromised hosts, and they came up with a definition of what they refer to as putative uh, aspergillus infection based on uh, either BAL culture, PCR, bronchial aspirate, galactomannan, etc. So they developed their own definition here. Um, they had one in 28 with a probable invasive aspergillosis. So this was an immunocompromised host. 
and eight others that were not immunocompromised where they have this potential diagnosis made. They didn't find a difference in mortality between those with the IA diagnosis versus those without. Uh, two out of nine received antifungal treatment, both of those patients died. And then a larger study here, uh, again, from an Italian group during the first wave there. Um, patients intubated for more than 48 hours in the ICU. They did a BAL, so a lavage of, um, of, of the bronchi on day zero and day seven of the ICU admission. They used two different definitions of what a potential invasive aspergillosis infection may be. Um, I think I, I skip over the details here. Depending on the definition they used, either roughly one quarter to 27.7% were diagnosed in the other group or with the other criteria for 17.6%. And 41% of, of the patients died. What you can see in the two Kaplan Meyer curves at the bottom here is that if you're using the Kappa criteria, there's a significant difference uh, in terms of mortality risk be between those who meet the definition and those who don't. And even more so when you use the, uh, the PIPA definition or ASP ICU definition, which is an older definition, more than a decade old at this point, which was developed for invasive aspergillosis in critically ill uh, patients. So they use, if using that, there's more of a difference in mortality. So probably more suggestive that in fact, those cases that you pick up may actually be more severely sick and may potentially benefit from treatment. They also found an association between the probability of mortality and the galactomannan index. So the, and I would say the, the galactomannan index can be considered the surrogate of of the bio burden of an infection with, with aspergillus and Again, they, they saw a or noticed a association here. The questions, and that's like a short detour into research methodology here is we obviously have very sick patients either with flu or COVID-19 intubated in the ICU. That in itself results in a high risk of death. And we know that the very sick patients intubated in the ICU seem to have an association with potential invasive aspergillosis. Sorry about that. And we know that invasive aspergillosis, in particular in the immunocompromised host, is associated with a high risk of death. Um, the question is, do we have what I put in here? If you have this diagnosis of potential invasive aspergillosis and you need the right definition for that, and in order to validate your definition, you would like to treat or not treat those patients, and if you treat them, you would like to see a reduction in risk of death. And I think that's the kind of work that's, that's required to draw firm conclusions of which of all of those definitions may actually be useful in a clinical setting to make decisions whether to treat the aspergillus that you may find in a BAL, for example, or not, and whether there's other clinical um, criteria that should guide your treatment decisions. So, I stopped the detour here. Treatment of invasive aspergillosis, uh, regardless of whether it's flu, COVID related, or in the typical immunocompromised host, boriconazole, more recently, isobuconazole was added to uh, our toolbox, second line, AMPO-B, and the echinocandins. How frequent is azole resistance? So, in particular, voriconazole that I mentioned previously as our current first-line treatment. Uh, you can see that there are regions with more than 10% reported. We have Texas here, the UK, and the Netherlands. Netherlands being an outlier here because typically they have relatively low, other than ESPL, um, resistance issues there. Um, then 1.5, 1 to 5 percent, that's where Canada sits, and then there's some countries in between, like Brazil and, and China, here for example, is 5 to 10 percent. Experts recommend that if you're sitting at more than 10 percent, I would say expected resistance, that you combine your boriconazole with either amphobion or an echinocandine. 
if you are in that range of one to five percent where we currently sit to test if um, if there's a clinical failure of treatment and if you're in the range of five to ten percent to do routine testing. Um, Triazole resistance is associated with higher mortality, depending on the study, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent higher. So clinically very significant to have resistance versus resistant versus no uh, not resistant strains. Um, we don't do routine success, success, susceptibility testing widely. We don't do uh, wide surveillance. So um, we don't have the greatest data on, on that. And to add to that, most patients are culture negative, so they fall into the typically uh, probable or uh, possible infection group. And uh, in many cases, it's galactoman and, and the other criteria. So in many patients wouldn't even be able to get uh, susceptibilities. What are the risk factors for resistance? And that's where I will be handing over to, to Greg. So resistance can can be found or uh, can be developed in vivo. Uh, it's been shown in cavities of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis patients who are on long-term acid exposures, where you can see the wild type, type as well as resistant strains in the same host. And typically the resistant strains having um, a lower fitness compared to the wild type and as such not necessarily taking over in the um, situation of an invasive aspergillosis, it's really about which environmental spores do you happen to inhale. And of course, you can make an argument if you are on prophylaxis with, say, pulsoconazole, it's probably more likely that if you inhale multiple spores of a multiple um, strains, that the one that may eventually be su uh, successful is the one that's resistant to, to your assholes. And the main risk factor there is not necessarily the exposure uh, in the individual, it's more the exposure in the environment. And that's where the importance of the One Health approach really kicks in, because if we want to reduce the risk of getting exposed to resistant uh, Aspergillus fumigatus for our most susceptible patients, uh, we would need to reduce the, um, the environmental contamination with, with those drugs. And that's where I'm handing over to Greg now. So. All right. So you should see everything. So yeah, so thanks, Dominic. So yeah, so I'm going to start talking about the concept of that One Health approach. So, oops, this is thick. So basically, the One Health approach is the um, uh, the aspect that every aspect of our world is connected. So this includes human health, animal health, and especially environmental health, where many of our infections originate from, and where there is potential resistance strains present, as Dominic stated. Um, this is also where my work comes into play, uh, as I study environmental aspergillosis. So environmental aspergillus species. Um, and I obtain um, uh, azel septility data from these environmental locations all across the planet. Um, alterations in these aspects can ultimately lead to many different human diseases. As Dominic Gray stated, many diseases have arisen from animal and environmental vectors, especially for fungal diseases. Um, so the One Health approach is the collaboration of many multidisciplinary fields from local, national, and geographic levels. Um, so this involves this kind of animal-human uh, environment interface, where we share the same environment, eat similar food, and also share medication among our agricultural, when we use fungicides, from our veterinary practices that use similar azoles to, and similar antifungals that we use in our own human healthcare. So the One Health works. Uh, the One Health approach works with organizations and sectors, and as I stated, um, uh, healthcare. So that's human and animal, um, agricultural, environmental sectors, and of course trade and travel and transportation, and all these um, uh, facilitate the transport of um, uh, fungal pathogens or any kind of pathogen 
um, for many different sectors of the planet. Um, and the ultimate goal of the One Health approach is just to disease surveillance, um, to determine where outbreaks can occur, and to prevent any um, uh, diseases from really causing too much damage. So uh, just to put in perspective of fungi, um, as we do see increase of face fungal infections, most, path most pathogenic fungi are optimistic, so they're not oblique pathogens. Uh, their primary niche is within the environment. And as Dominic probably, um, uh, stated, um, these environmental um, uh, fungi are what we are breathing in, and those are the ones that contain um, uh, resistance genes. So for Aspergillus, um, we do find lots of triazole resistance present in environments from certain locations, such as India. Um, fungi are primary pathogen of plants, so as well as the high fungicide use within agriculture facilitates the development of resistance in the environment. Um, also, environmental alterations may also cause the development of virulent resistance strains. So basically expanding the niche of these pathogens so that they can infect um, further people. And this is primarily due to climate change. So uh, now to start talking about how antifungal resistance is defined uh, before I actually go into the meat of antifungal resistance for all the three classes of antifungals. Um, so this is a review. So we have in vitro resistance, which comes in as resistance breakpoints. So for fungal infections, there's very few as they're very hard to culture. Um, so resistance breakpoints are just the um, a concentration that we know would work within a patient. Um, most fungal infections need to use epidemiological, epidemiological cutoff values such as the MIC or MEC. And this is just the concentration which um, uh, the, fungi, the fungus is unable to grow at. Um, and then there's also clinical resistance, which is defined by resistance breakpoins. It goes by uh, patient by patient basis, but mostly involves just getting enough drug to where it needs to be in the patient. And that's dependent on a wide range of factors. So I want to just briefly go over why the resistance phenotype develops. Um, it comes in two factors, both biological factors and clinical ones. Um, so for biological factors, there's the mutation rate, uh, which how quickly resistance can be obtained. That can happen in the environment or in the patient. The population size, as well as any kind of selection coefficients. So some um, uh, genotypes may have predisposed um, aspects of them that may cause uh, a greater chance for resistance to develop. Um, and there's a wide range of clinical factors. I did not include all of them, but there's some ones I want to go through one by one. Um, and I'll just try to use Aspergillus as a case study for just um, uh, explaining them. So for example, incorrect diagnosis could lead to um, a clinical resistance phenotype as this include Sorry. All right. Let's well, conclude. I'm uh, incorrectly diagnosing a Aspergillus um, uh, infection, or it can also include a co-infection, such as whether a um, tuberculosis is being is co-infected with Aspergillus. Um, the patient is highly immunocompromised, um, so there is some requirement for the patient to eliminate the fungal infection from their body and antifungals might not be able to fully attain that state. A high fungal load can cause the addition of antifungals to be unable to clear the entire um, patient from their infection. The pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drugs that are considered. Um, that means that there's enough drug that's being metabolized by the patient um, in order to be effective, or it's um, uh, and drug-drug interactions also key, as many patients in these wards are taking many other drugs, such as for cancer treatment. Oops, I must have hit a button. Up oh, there you go. 
Um, the site of infection is important. Um, this determines whether the antifungal is able to hit, um, uh, sorry, able to interact with the pathogen of choice. Um, for example, in cryptococcus infections, um, they invade the central nervous system. So having antifungals are able to target these um, sites such as fluconazole uh, are key. This also includes foreign bodies such as catheters. Um, they can be a source of biofilms. And lastly, this is just a preventative step is the proper management of the underlying disease. So any kind of preventive measures or correctly treating the patient of their um, uh, disease can prevent a fungal infection from occurring in the first place. Um, now I just wanna go through the types of diseases I will be covering. So, um, and the antifungals used within each disease. So we have cryptococcosis, um, invasive aspergillosis, and invasive candiasis. Um, for cryptococcosis, it's mostly amphotericin B with fluconazole or flucytosine. Um, aspergillosis is mostly using azoles with polyenes and canocandins, as Dom Dominic stated, for secondary treatment. Um, and invasive candiasis, you primarily use canocandins. And these antifungal classes target all different, um, uh, not different targets. The triazoles target ergosterol biosynthesis, a cholesterol analog for fungi. Um, polyenes directly target ergosterol. Um, opposed from the biosynthesis pathway. And the kinocannons target the cell wall biosynthesis of beta, uh, beta 1 3 D glucan. And flucyacine directly interacts with um, uh, DNA synthesis. Um, so these are the three classes I will be primarily focusing on as well. Um, one important note is that fungicidal antifungals are primarily preferred for treatment as this eliminates the need for an immunocompromised patient to clear the infection when you do use a fungistatic um, uh, antifungal, which just inhibits growth. All right, and before I talk about all the resistance stuff, I might as well show you a quick timeline of how the antifungals are developed throughout the years. Um, so originally started with amphotericin B and flucytosine um, as the only two options. Um, the first prime widely used azole was fluconazole, and it began uh, use in 1990. I do want to make special note of the lipid formulation of amphotericin B. Um, amphotericin B is really a high toxic um, antifungal, lots of nephrotoxicity. So having a far less severe version of it was um, great success for um, a fungal treatment. And the echinocandids was, is the most recent class to be used, and that started with the gaspa function. And I do want to bring to note that from the latest triazole to the second latest triazole, there's been a 10 year gap in the amount of new antifungals coming into, the, into play. So we are due to, um, uh, for novel antifungals for treatment of fungal diseases. So I'll first talk about the mechanisms of resistance of those three or the four classes of antifungals. And then I'll, um, uh, and the talk with the new upcoming antifungals. So, so to so start off with the triazoles. Um, these target the ergosterol biosynthesis pathway. And depending on the genus, it's either they target ERG11 or CYP51A, um, and inhibiting it, and that causes the accumulation of the toxic sterol to occur. Um, usually these mutations are that cause resistance, cause resistance for multiple azoles. Um, and the primary ones are either substitution mutations within ERG11 or CYP51A, or the target or the overexpression of one of those two targets. Um, this overburdens the, this lets the antifungal, the azole unable to bind to ERG11, or the overexpression overwhelms the uh, amount of azoles present in the cell. And the second way, common way of happening is um, a transporter overexpression through the increase in e efflex pumps. So 
Um, since Azels have to enter the cell, increase the number of afflux pumps, and uh, pumps them out, promoting resistance. Um, so the second one is the kinocandins I'll talk about. Um, these inhibit the cell wall. So this is beta-1,3 D-glucan synthase. Um, they target specifically the FKS1 subunit, and that just destabilizes the cell wall, leading to cell death. Um, mutations in these FKS subunits can confer resistance to kinocandins, um, uh, inhibiting their effect. Also, the um, uh, increase in stress response pathways uh, also help um, uh, decrease cell wall stress and prevent survival, uh, promote survival. I'll be talking about these later. I just do want to make note that as kinocandins do not enter the cells, e flux pumps are uh, a non-issue. Um, the amphotericin B um, is the most widely and lo um, uh, long-term antifungal in use, as its resistance rarely develops. Um, these target um, uh, ergosterol. Um, these create pores in the fungal membrane, promoting leakage, as well as oxidative stress. Um, so this is the lipid formulation and deposits amphotericin B, it binds to or interacts with ergosterol, creating pores within the membrane, not leading to cell death. However, the resistance mechanism is not truly understood. Um, ergosterol is very key component of the cell membrane. So any kind of modifications to it is probably detrimental to fungal fitness and therefore do not occur. However, um, uh, the it's usually resistant thought to be the depletion or the replacement of ergosterol with an alternate sterol. Um, these are usually occur in candida erg3 mutations, which was one of the earliest mutations in the pathway. Um, also enhanced stress response pathway is key to um, uh, promoting survival in amphotericin uh, B treated cells, which is a key pathway that kind of involves all the aces all the antifungals, I should say. The last one is what I'll go through quickly is flucytosine, which is just the cytosine analog. Um, it interferes with DNA and protein synthesis. Itself has no effect, but as it's metabolized by a cell, um, it can incorporate itself into the mRNA and into the DNA and inhibit both. Um, high resistance develops when it's used alone, so it's always used in combination with other antifungals, and it's very commonly used in cryptococcosis treatments. Um, resistance is primarily caused by the reduced uptake. So uh, efflux pumps or intake pumps are overexpressed, sorry, underexpressed and overexpressed to reduce flucytosine inside the cell. And flucytosine is also metabolized by the cell. Also, increased in primidine synthesis just outcompetes the effects of flucytosine. All right. Uh, now that I got all those primary resistance mechanisms out of the way, um, I do want to talk about some other resistance mechanisms that come into play for each of the um, drugs, each of the antifungals. I'm only I'm, uh, going to talk about azoles and kinocandins as uh, amphotericin B. The resistance mechanisms are not widely known. And for flucytosine, um, the resistance mechanisms are quite commonly known. And I've already discussed them. And also um, uh, state which um, uh, fungal genus is being affected by each of these resistance mechanisms. So to start off with biofilms, this is primarily a candida um, uh, mechanism that just prevents um, uh, antifungal drugs from even getting close to any of the cells. Um, the biofilms are composed of lots of cell wall constituents. So it sequesters both azoles and candidins away from fungal cells. Um, as I mentioned, the azoles, um, transporter overexpression does occur and primarily is um, a focus on azoles. Um, I just want to go into more details about how it does, does occur. There are two ways. Um, there's cis and trans acting regulatory enzymes that get overexpressed, and that just leads to an overexpression of these. Um, uh, efflux pumps. These are either ABC transporters or MFS transporters. This is candida drug resistance or multi-drug resistance. This is used in fungi. And the mRNA stability of those transcripts also increased for those transporters. 
chromosomal abnormalities usually lead to the increase of ERG11. Um, and these occur in Candida and Cryptococcus. This is either through loss of heterozygous gosti, leading to the mutant allele appearance, or through higher copy number and aneuploidies. Um, HSP90 in this response. This is key for not just in kinogenes, but all antifungals in general. Um, HSP90 is a key um, a protein. It's a heat shock protein key for stimulating the production of cell wall components, um, every single cell wall component. Um, and it's usually a key target in developing new antifungals as well. Um, so that's a key role in um, uh, chitin synthesis and in cell wall integrity as this heat shock pathway leads to the increase of chitin as well as every other um, cell wall component through the stimulation of their um, uh, respective biosynthesis pathways. Okay, um, so those are the resistance. Now I just want to talk about the antifungal drug development and some considerations I need to take into account when developing novel drugs. So a major issue is that fungi are eukaryotes, so host toxicity must be considered. Um, putative drugs are rigorously tested, where 80% of new targets turn out to be false positives. Um, Drug-drug interactions are key, as I mentioned earlier. Um, whether it is narrow or broad spectrum. So broad spectrums are generally preferred as the antifungal, as they target a variety of um, pathogenic fungal species. But narrow spectrum antifungals must be might be necessary if they have high effectiveness against a certain genus. And this is where intrinsic resistances come into play for each um, uh, fungi. Uh, whether the um, uh, antifungal is fungicidal or fungistatic, as I mentioned, fungicidal are preferred. Um, the drug penetration in vivo is important. Um, whether it, can have, it may have a high um, effectiveness in vitro, but if you need a 20 fold increase in concentration in vivo, um, it's not as effective. And intravenous or oral administration, or oral administration is just easier for the patients. So, all in all, it must, out, for designing a new drug, the positive must outweigh the negatives. So, um, now to talk about these targets, um, there's the ones we just used are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, as you see here, the dark blue um, uh, blocks are the um, uh, four antifungals I talked about in my presentation so far. And then the slime boxes are all these new antifungals that have specific targets to many different aspects of the fungal cell. Um, through the stress response, as I mentioned, there's mitochondria, the metabolism, and many other cell wall components as well, and cell membrane components. And so major novel targets, the lots of key talk about in research, is primarily calcinurin and HSP90, as they're part of the same stress pathway. And if the stress pathway is disabled um, and used in combination with other antifungals, um, they might become more effective. The trailhose pathway is also a key pathway as it's not present in mammals. Um, this pathway is key for um, uh, cell wall stabilization as well as signaling for other, uh, signaling as a signaling molecule. And sphingolithid synthesis is also a great target for fungi as um, uh, they are important for their metabolism. Um, so basically, we're just looking for differences between fungi, uh, fungal cells, and mammalian cells so that we can exploit them for our benefit. And now, lastly, I just want to talk about drugs that I thought were interesting that are coming up. Um, there's a new class of orotomides, which target protein biosynthesis via the dihydrogenase, which is, has oral film and has high anti aspergillus activity. False manojetics. Um, this inhibits the calcium phosphate inositol, which is very important for maintaining the integrity of the fungal cell wall, and has broad spectrum activity, and it's capable of killing Candida auris, for example, as well as it is multi-resistant. Um, and then there's the new alumine, which can inhibit the mitochondrial membrane potential. 
I also, I want to um, talk about some updated antifungals that target the same pathway, but are just all, all improved. So itraconazole has roughly kind of a favor, but the supraiconazole has a longer lasting effect. And this VT5998 um, is a new azole that eliminates many of the um, uh, annoying side effects that aces have with drug-drug interactions. Um, and that's just promoting the benefit for the patient. There's the calculated amphotericin B, which is just or can be orally administered, which is a great benefit. And abrexafungur, which has the same target as kinocandid, so it targets the same pathway, just targets the tryptopene subunit instead. And has no cross resistance. So even if kinocandid resistance is present, um, no cross resistance occurs when cancer is used. And this um, fun, uh, antifungal can also um, uh, kill candida or cells. All right, now just to close off my talk, I do want, as I started this talk with talking about One Health, I do want to bring back to that statement of One Health that we should start treatment before using any kind of antifungal. Um, as I mentioned, there's a high fungal diversity in the environment. So fungal, fungi, and especially some pathogenic fungi that are present in the environment exist with many other species, and they have adapted to compete with these fungal species. So when they invade a human host, um, they can they have a wide range of pathways that can help survive inside um, uh, humans. Um, so the work I do involves um, uh, uh, obtaining environmental genotypes, and I identify if there can be predisposed um, uh, resistance within them. So essentially by obtaining genotypes of many different environmental um, uh, populations, we can potentially predict or identify resistance traits, or if they are resistant, we can group them into population clusters and predict the likelihood of potential resistance break outbreaks within these populations. Other work in our lab also involves using um, a whole genome data to identify diagnostic markers that can be used to identify resistance traits. Um, so ultimately this could um, uh, help to lead to using drug resistant markers within patients, um, hopefully leading to a targeted point of care practices. Um, potentially, so this part of point of care practices um, can lead um, a res or physicians to identify the correct azole or antifungal to use for a particular infection. Um, so this will prolong the lifespan of existing antifungals and lead to better outcomes for patients. All right, so I'd like to thank everyone that was part of our lab. And yeah, and thank you for all for participating both Dominic's and my presentations. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. Those were great presentations. Antifungal resistance isn't something that we hear about a lot, but it's so important. Um, so I'm going to go to the questions now. Uh, there's a question for Dominic from Jerry Wright. Uh, he says, it's striking that treatment outcomes in the case of mold infections are so poor. Is this because the drugs are lousy or are the criteria for what is an actual infection rather than spores just hanging around in the lung fluids of very sick, pe very sick people? Uh, do we need better drugs or better diagnostics? I think all of those are true. Um, the drugs certainly aren't perfect, but uh, they do work. And we typically say roughly half of the patients um, do respond to treatment. Doesn't necessarily mean that they will eventually make it, though, uh, in particular in those heavily immunocompromised individuals. But in, in the absence of treatment, uh, mortality rate is close to 100%. So keeping in mind that um, they do work, uh, it could be better, but then all the host factors play in, right? You have typically patients with pretty much zero immune response. So everything you do must be through your drug. Um, so a better truck may make a difference for sure if it's if it's more active. And the other piece, the diagnostics, certainly is a major challenge. Um, as I said, it's it, it's in many instances it's a 
yeah, maybe, maybe not kind of uh, diagnosis using surrogates to um, that aren't perfect to make the diagnosis. We're probably missing some diagnosis at the same time we are over diagnosing in others. So the diagnostics are a big issue. And also we, we go with uh, the definition that I've shown in terms of immunocompromised hosts. We even have more issues around that in the, um, the otherwise more or less healthy individuals like the, the flu and COVID-19 patients that I've shown, which wouldn't have a significantly immunocompromised status. Um, and the aspergillus you find may just be hanging around as, as Jerry said, and uh, having a clear definition or a clinical pathway to decide, okay, this patient actually has most likely an invasive infection and we have to treat that's simply lacking and the be better diagnostics would certainly come a long way. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for Greg about, um, you mentioned quite a few new compounds that are coming online. Are, are those driven by the need to treat humans or is the drive for creating new antifungals coming more from the agricultural sector since it's such a huge problem in agriculture? Well, um, I, I assume it's gonna be for humans. I'm actually not too familiar with the problem with uh, my agricultural sector, mm -hmm. but for in the human cases, um, as resistance is increasing and in, well, as the level of resistance to multiple drugs is increasing, especially with Candida auris. Um, I'm pretty sure new drugs are required to help treat those infections, primarily for humans. I'm not too familiar with the agricultural aspect, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I just, I just wonder, you know, with the amount of antifungals that are used in agriculture, if we're, you know, we need to anticipate that that's going to drive resistance to some of these classes of um, antifungals as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, lots of um, uh, genetically modified organisms do help with some resistance to fungi. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be our saving grace in that aspect to reduce antifungal use. But many um, uh, other countries that do not have these luxuries might still need to use high levels of antifungals within their agriculture. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Jerry has a second question. Uh, do we ever see mucor infections in our region? I understand these are increasing in the US. I don't have the answer for, for that. I know in the US it's still less than 10% of the mold infections, but I am not familiar with any Canadian data specifically. Um, not sure. I, I think Eva is, is online. Maybe maybe she can. She's doing a lot of immunocompromised ID. Maybe she wants to weigh in here. Um, I would say it still remains quite rare. Uh, but you have an, an additional patient population there with the diabetics that are at higher risk. Mm -hmm. Eva, anything to add? Eva says we need better and earlier diagnostics. Yeah, I think that was in response to Jerry's. Totally agreed with question. that. Um, and Jerry also wants to know, what about Candida neoformans? This used to be a big concern on the West Coast. Haven't uh, seen any, any here so far. Okay. Um, so Candida uh, cryptococcus gadii? Or cryptococcus yeah, gadii? I thought gadii was the big problem in the, what was it, uh, sea lions on the, <laughs> on the West Coast were thought to be a source of gadii? Um, okay. Martha says that we see mucor infections in kids, but I can't say what the percentage is. Oh, he means cryptococcus neoformans. Sorry. Okay, that makes he says, sense. He says yeah. not enough okay. coffee. And yes, yeah. I should have known that neoformans goes with cryptococcus. <laughs> I second the not enough coffee. I, I just noticed it's been renamed. Yeah, I, I missed that part. It, it would be cryptococcus neoformans. Yeah. Um, Dominic, I have a question for you about, you mentioned a few studies where people have looked at the consequences for aspergillosis of having COVID and mechanical ventilation. And I, what strikes me is there's just so much 
burden of COVID disease right now that how much of these statistics are underreported because nobody has the time to do these kinds of detailed studies? Like how much um, are we missing? In terms of COVID cases of, or aspergillus in COVID? I'm, I'm just thinking of all the secondary infections yeah. that COVID patients are dying from that are probably not getting well documented because there's just no time to do those detailed yeah. follow-up of so, why someone actually died. So th there was just a um, systematic review that came out looking at bacterial co-infections and it's less than 10% in the COVID patients. So it doesn't seem as frequent as you would see, for example, in severe flu cases where uh, in particular pneumococcal is a typical complication. So that doesn't seem to be the case in COVID. Um, there's certainly a risk that we are missing things because we are either too focused or too busy just taking care of, of the COVID aspects. On the other hand, it's also the opposite sometimes. I think all the aspergillus work that's happening is uh, we may overestimate its importance because we have so many COVID patients and so we, we do the BAL, we test for things that we wouldn't have done in the past with other diseases. So I think it can go in either direction, depending on what you're looking for. Given that we have so many cases, you can find pretty much everything in those patients. But then the question is, is it something that's unique or truly frequent and the major driver in terms of um, infection or mortality risk eventually in those patients or not. And I think that's the piece that we are really struggling with. And to me, the, um, the Aspergillus fumigatus data that I've shown is uh, one, of, one of those examples where um, it, it's very hard to put it into a clinical context, how relevant it is and whether those patients would benefit from treatment. And Probably the real question is which subgroup of those patients actually have in, has invasive aspergillosis and would benefit from treatment. And um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the piece we are struggling with as well. We may be missing things, but we may also overestimate some things that are relatively normal in critically ill patients and we overemphasize it and it actually doesn't make a difference. And as I said, I don't know exactly where this fits in. There's probably subgroups for, for each of those, but I'm not sure what the proportion would be. Um, there's one more comment. Thank you, Dominic. There's one more comment from Martha. Um, she said, if we did bronchoscopy on a random selection of other critically ill patients, how often would we find aspergillosis? Yeah, that's exactly what I just tried to say, right? We, we, we do this work because people feel like oh, maybe aspergillus is a, is a common co-infection. We don't necessarily know how that would like uh, in a random intubated patient. And I think all of us would remember the odd case where we have someone intubated, we do a BAL and there's uh, some aspergillus there. And we would usually have said, ah, that's just the, the odd aspergillus in the lungs. Uh, we don't necessarily need to treat given the overall picture, but we haven't done it as systematically as people now have done it with COVID. So that makes it very difficult to, to interpret. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I guess my other question was how, how would the um, administration of steroids, which is, you know, I guess becoming more common in COVID patients impact on having such kind of fungal infections because yeah, so, I know that would be a, probably a bad thing, right? Well, at, at least chronic steroid exposure is certainly a risk factor, uh, in particular if it's high dose, whether the treatment dose really makes a difference. Again, it's questionable. You can argue, well, if you have some level of invasive aspergillosis already and you throw uh, steroids on them, it may make it worse. On the other hand, you have the studies that show a mortality benefit. So looking at the bigger picture, uh, it's the right thing to do at this point of time. Maybe there's the odd case that has a true invasive aspergillosis that may have had a better outcome without, who knows. But for the population at large, uh, it looks like steroids are basically the only drug that, that clearly reduces mortality at this point mm. in time. Okay, uh, I'm just looking at the time. We're over the hour. So thank you both again very much for those interesting presentations.
And thank everybody else for joining us early in the morning into January. And we'll see you next month for February's rounds.